Okay. We're okay. only down a we're only down a handful of people. We're at twenty eight. We were up at thirty eight when we first started, but there you go. Okay. Well, welcome back. Good afternoon to everyone. I hope you had a nice break. Actually, here, I live in Happy Valley. It's sunny and a, a very nice day. I hope wherever you are that you're able to enjoy the day as well. Yep. So we had a, <clears throat> a, a good conversation for the last 15 minutes this morning, and you may have more questions, comments, follow-ups. So when we have our conversation at the end of this session, if you want to bring up things from earlier today, uh, we can do that as well. Uh, there's no limit to, uh, to the topics, as long as it's somehow related to profits. So this afternoon, our first topic is to look at prophets as inspired poets. Well, if we look first of all at that word inspired, in general, a good poet of any kind, you know, we might think of Robert Frost or Browning or um, uh, Emily Dickinson. We can certainly speak of them as inspired because they have a, a dynamism that really captures us. When we talk about biblical prophets, the prophets of the, the baptized, um, think of inspired as with that capital I, that the inspiration is not only because they have a certain power to their words, but that there's also that power of the Holy Spirit breathing within them, the inspired poets. A number of years ago, I was um, working on a class on prophets. I was sitting at the dining room table with things spread out all over the table, and there happened to be um, a furnace repairman there. And he looked at what I was doing, and he says, oh, what are you working on? And I told him I was teaching a class on prophets. He looked shocked sat down abruptly and said, is it all happening now? Is it all happening now? For him, the notion of prophecy was primarily about foretelling, that what the prophets said centuries ago was foretelling something that may have been happening right in the present moment. So that the aspect of foretelling has certainly uh, been a part of the understanding of prophecy, and it is it, it does have one dimension of it. But rather than thinking of prophets as foretelling, one way that they have been described is as forth-telling. They're telling forth. They are speaking to the community. And as they do so, they do it in a language that is best described as poetic. The poetic language is their method of forthtelling, and at times even foretelling. So this afternoon, we'll look at prophets as inspired, both inspired by their talent, by their energy, by their study, and inspired by the Holy Spirit. We can think of that in, in general at, uh, with the biblical um, corpus in general. You know, that, that there are words that are so beautiful, masterfully inspired by the, uh, the depth of their, their language, their ability to communicate. And it is also spirit-inspired in the way that they communicate God's message. When we look at prophets as poets, I've chosen two quotes. The first one from Walter Brueggemann. The overriding reality of the prophets is that they were characteristically poets. Now, I don't know if uh, others of you love poetry as much as I do. I, I love poetry. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about poets uh, this afternoon. But the poetry of prophets is not characterized by rhyme and rhythm, although sometimes it has that. But it is characterized very often by the imagery that they use by the experience that they elicit in those who are hearing. That poets um, somehow bring about an experience that is more than just an intellectual comprehension. Emily Dickinson talks about that experience. If I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, 
I know that is poetry. Uh, and there are some times when the words of the, the biblical prophets as well as contemporary prophets feel as if the top of our heads are taken off. Or like Jeremiah, it feels like fire or gives us an ache, uh, a stomach ache, uh, feels like a hammer that is hitting us. One of the uh, wonderful contemporary biblical scholars, Robert Alter, and I'll be referring to him a bit more uh, this afternoon, uh, talks about the fact that the way that the prophets wrote was in elevated language. It wasn't just the ordinary common speech. It had an elevated language, particularly when they were communicating the word of God. And he calls that elevated language poetry. Well, there are a lot of different ways of describing poetry, anyone's poetry, but particularly the poetry of the prophets, that poetry that we experience. Elizabeth Boyle in the uh, quote on your handout says that poetry can be defined as a way of seeing as well as a way of saying. So let's just stop there a minute that when the prophets are communicating the message of God, that very often we can see it, hear it, feel it, taste it, smell it. Think of Jesus as a poet. So certainly there are many books, many articles uh, that look at Jesus as a prophet. And I would ask, what kind of a prophet? He was a poetic prophet. If we look at poetry as this ability to communicate that elicits an experience, look at how he uses the images around, you know, the seeds, the birds, the farmer, uh, the householder. Those were all things that people could see and relate to their own experience. So poetry whether it is the poetry of the, the Hebrew prophets or the poetry of Jesus, somehow helps us to see what they're talking about. And when I say see, associate that also with the other senses that we have. Boyle goes on to say that poets not only speak, but also see and listen. So in order to be a prophetic poet, they have also listened, they've also seen, and then find a way of communicating. And they do so in a combination of language and silence that engages the dynamics of the whole person. Poetry often has silence that when we are experiencing what they're saying, we want to feel that silence. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever studied or heard about white fire and black fire in the Jewish interpretation of the word of God. Is that familiar to you at all? Well, the understanding, and this is something that, that uh, in their, their mystical or their meditative, almost a sort of Alexio Divina of the word, they talk about what is actually written the word that is written into the sacred text, onto the scroll, they call that black fire, almost as if the fire of God's word has come down and it has seared the very parchment so that the word, we see it, it is black fire. At the same time, there's a lot of white fire. White fire is all of the space around the words, the things that are not said the questions that arise, the feelings that we may have. And as we listen to biblical poetry, whether it's the poetry of Jesus or the poetry of the ancient prophets, I think it can be helpful to be attentive, not just to the black fire, those words that are said, but to the white fire. What's left unsaid? What questions do these words raise? How do we experience them? An example, um, it comes from Robert Alter. So let me just mention him I've, I, uh, a little bit. He is a, a present day Jewish Hebrew scholar. And actually, if you can see right here, 
I just splurged and bought the three volume Hebrew Bible that he translated and has commentary in it. And he tries to capture as best he can the power, the beauty, and the poetry of the Hebrew scriptures. So here we have um, this verse that comes from the first chapter of Isaiah. And we'll be looking at Isaiah as a masterful poet this afternoon. So Isaiah starts off by saying, Ah, sinful nation. In Hebrew, Hoi goi chote. Just listen to that. Hoi goi chote. The sound itself already has this powerful resonance. The word hoi is often translated either as awe or alas or woe. When we hear that word, it just, it invites a pause. It invites white fire. Woe, not, not the woe that you say to a horse, but alas, alack, ah, something startling. It's, it's a word of surprise. So if um, you are reading a, a text from the prophets or readers at, at mass, encourage them, stop. Let the white fire sink in. Woe, sinful nation. Then what does a sinful nation look like? Because we said that poetry is not just hearing, it's seeing. So here's what the sinful nation looks like. A people laden with wickedness. That's the, the New American Bible translation. Robert Alter translates it people weighed down with crime. You can feel it. Because they are a sinful nation, the, the, the weight of their sin has just brought them down. They are laden, they are weighed down with crime. One of the things that we, when we talk about listening is that we want to listen, hear, and experience the descriptions that are there. Not so that, that our heads are filled with information, but rather to let that experience sink in. Uh, that's as described by Elizabeth Boyle, that she says that poets, and I would add prophets, know that their purpose of their language is neither to transmit information, nor to simplify complexity, but rather to evoke an experience. And as the experience, as, as we have the experience of listening to the word, then it is to bring about a response, an effective response to create an intellectual and emotional environment for an encounter with the word as presence. The word of God is God's own present presence. The Lord and God is right here in that poetic word. A contemporary author and poet, and I will refer to her again, and this book is on the resources in, in, uh, on your handout. It's called When Poets Pray. And the author, Marilyn McIntyre, has a lot of insight. She's talking about poets, but I would say everything she says about poets applies equally to prophets. Remember, we're talking about biblical prophets. We're talking about our own prophetic voice. Poets and prophets slow us down. They teach us to stop and go in before we go on. So that when we are either proclaiming a prophetic word or listening to one, we go slowly so that we can actually enter in. Poets play at the edges of mystery, holding a tension between line and sentence, between sense and reason between the epiphanic, something that is a, a manifestation, a new epiphany, and the deeply comfortingly familiar. So we notice that in the prophets and in Jesus. Doesn't he use the most familiar comforting images? You know, seeds, gardens, things that people know, family situations, a story, a story of a father and sons, very familiar. Um, you might try 
hearing that story again and writing it as a sort of poem. Separate the lines, listen, hear the white space uh, in between. So it's a very familiar story. The story of fathers and sons, the tension between the sons themselves. And then he adds something that is joltingly unfamiliar, epiphanic, an epiphany, something new. So when we listen to the poetry of the prophets, that's what we often will experience, this kind of almost juxtaposition. Oh, we know what the prophet's talking about. We're familiar with that. And then there will be something new and dramatic. As a community, we are prophets both by what we proclaim and by what we hear. Listening to, as McIntyre says, there's a difference between listening for and listening to. If we listen for something, we seem to pay attention until we hear what we want to hear. I'm listening for this. But if we are listening to, we are opening to something new, opening to possibility. And she says that that listening to requires of us as a prophetic listening community, an intentional disposition, attitude, and readiness. She goes on to say it's something like open-hearted waiting, breathing, relaxing into wordlessness, becoming aware of presence. Many of you preach on a regular basis. This is, is what happens in the preparation for preaching, to listen to the prophetic word, whether it's literally one of the prophets, or maybe it's the word of Jesus, maybe it's the word of St. Paul, all of them which have that characteristic of being prophetic poets. Perhaps the, the clearest example of being a community ready to have that attitude of listening is in the Shema. Hear, O Israel. Listen, O Israel. Continue to listen. Without reading the entirety of that quote, let me just go to the last part of it, in which it talks about this verb, Shema, which also means to be obedient, to listen, to hear, to be obedient, implies not only hearing, perceiving, interpreting, but also remembering. When we're truly listening, we remember what God has already spoken, whether in the biblical word, in the tradition, in creation, in poetry. We remember and we continue to hear. A living word is carried into the future by a living people, constituting an undying community of auditors. You know, I like that word auditor. We often think of auditors in a class, those that don't have to do anything except be there. But as a community of auditors, it means all of these qualities, an open-hearted, waiting, breathing, relaxing, and so on. So that call to listen is certainly a part that is repeated over and over, that we are to hear, to listen um, over and over, accepting that role of being a hearer. Um, we're talking primarily about prophets in the Hebrew tradition, but certainly the New Testament is filled with prophets, including Jesus himself. And a, a verse that ties in with this is actually in Luke chapter 8, verse 18. You might want to follow up and look at your own translations on that later. But what Jesus is saying there is, pay attention how you hear. He doesn't say pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention to how you hear. You know, a, a number of you here I've had in class at, at Mount Angel, and you might be happy to know that there are some times that comments from students, insights from students, so stay with me that I use them. I plagiarize. I use them uh, in my own teaching. And a number of years ago, one of the Samoan students had a comment, um, a paper on this particular verse on Luke 8, 18. And he said that in Samoa, uh, 
I don't know if we have any Samoan uh, clergy, deacons, people there in Yakima. But he said that the word to hear or to listen in Samoa, fa'alongo, means more literally to be or to become like a bell, to be a bell. And then he demonstrated what that looks like. To be an individual or a community of prophetic listeners means that we, if we're like a bell, we have to be open. If a bell is set down, we cannot be open. We will not hear what a bell is intended to do. We have to be open. And then he noted how the little gonger on the bell strikes and fills the entirety of the bell, not just the one place where it hits. To be a community that is really hearing the prophetic word means total openness. And to let the word speak not only to our ears, but to our hearts, to our way of life. That is the, the call that is given over and over in the prophets. Hear, O heavens, give ear and hear my voice. Hear you who are far off and you who are near. This afternoon, we're going to look at the poetry of Isaiah. Since we only have one day, this morning we looked a, a bit at Jeremiah, this afternoon in this first talk at Isaiah. And as you know, the book of Isaiah is a compilation probably from three different historical periods. And the, the poets, the prophets at those different historical periods each have a poetic power in the way that they communicate the word, a power that evokes an experience. So the first Isaiah, Isaiah of Jerusalem, followed by Isaiah of Babylon, and then a later Isaiah, probably back in Jerusalem, draw on some similar imagery as well as um, the style of their poetry. So we're going to begin with that first poet, Isaiah of Jerusalem. I like what um, Isaiah, excuse me, what Robert Alter says about him, rather than reading the entirety of it, I just want to focus on that last sentence, with, which ties in with what we're talking about this afternoon. Perhaps the Israelites who clung to the parchment records of these sundry prophecies in the seventh and sixth centuries cherished them, not only because they saw in them the urgent word of God, but also because they somehow sensed that these were great poets. The, the poetry of Isaiah throughout the entirety of the book is so powerful because it continues to evoke that experience, to somehow draw us into the mystery, not just to be standing outside of it, but to enter into it. Um, Alter goes on to talk about that fact that Isaiah ha has um, a virtuosity that is expressed in, in numerous ways. He talks about the fact that he has pounding rhythms. Think of that, hoi goi chote. It, it just the, the words themselves have a, have a powerful to them. Luminous imaginings. We already saw in Jeremiah something similar. Imagining something new that the people have never experienced and giving them a picture of that. And with a picture of that, they're more likely to want to move forward, to be a part of it. One of the things that's characteristic of, of Isaiah is that he also has technical virtuosity, something that I don't have in this age of Zoom, uh, but the virtuosity that Isaiah had is so often lacking in our English translations. So let's just look at one example here, which is on your, your handout. This is talking about what God is looking for, what God desires. He looked for judgment, but see bloodshed. God looked for justice, but hark, alas, lo, behold, the outcry. So, in English, well, we, we get some sense of it, but in Hebrew, he has this play on words. 
when he's looking for judgment, he's looking for mishpat, and instead he, instead he gets mispach. You know, they sound very similar. He wants one thing and gets something that's so different, but sounds similar. He looks for justice, tzedakah, but instead he gets tzedakah. He looks for justice, but instead gets an outcry. So our, our English translation doesn't capture it. Excuse me. But our good friend Robert Alter really tries to do it. He says he looked for justice, but instead he got jaundice. Whoops. So you, you get the, the similar something that, that is very positive gets something totally negative. He looks for justice. Um, looking for looking for righteousness and instead gets wretchedness. So translations make a difference if we want to get a sense of the, the poetry. What I would encourage you, and we're going to do this in, a, in a, the poem that we're going to look at in a minute, we are given one translation in the lectionary, and that's the one that will be uh, used in the liturgy. But I really encourage you to look at other translations if you want to experience the poetry more fully. Um, just my brief critique of the NAB, it's generally quite accurate and poetically flat. It, it just usually does not capture the poetry the way that other translations might. So the, the first poem, poetic poem that we're going to look at, um, Isaiah 25, and this is the one that is this coming Sunday. That's why I chose it. It's a good example, and it's one that we will hear in this Sunday's liturgy. And... Oops, I thought that I wrote it down. Dear me. See, this tells you that I am better carving on stone. I'm sorry, I had it written on a different, I think it was on a different page. So the, the liturgy that we will hear this Sunday from Isaiah 25 uses um, a number of sense imagery aspects talks about rich food, choice wines. That, that, that's, you know, pretty good. A veil that veils all peoples, juicy, rich food, and a web. God will wipe away the tears. So that's what we will hear um, this Sunday. But let me read the way that um, Robert Alter translates it. Verses 6 to 10. And the Lord shall prepare a banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of rich food, a banquet of well-aged wines, rich food with marrow. Okay, let me just stop there. So the NAB says rich food, but if you think rich food with marrow, doesn't that already give you something that is just a much more sensory experience? well-aged wines, fine-strained. Choice wines, okay, but well-aged, fine-strained. Um, it even sounds more poetic, and you can feel it. And then it says that God shall swallow up on this mountain the veil that covers all the people. In the NAB translation, it says that God will destroy well, the word that is used there can mean destroy, but it can also mean to swallow up or consume. And I think by altar, keeping that word swallow up keeps that imagery of eating. You know, the first part is the eating, participating in the great banquet. 
And the second part is God's own swallowing up, as if God is consuming something and taking away the uh, death itself. So I encourage you, as you prepare and reflect on the poetry of our, our prophets, and even your own, go back and look. Is this uh, presenting a way of people entering into that experience and not just um, having a, um, an intellectual comprehension? Yes, this gives you an idea of my technology. Um, Isaiah was a technical virtuosity. I'm still learning this Zoom process. So the, the poetry of first Isaiah um, uh, is filled with the kind of imagery that continues into second and third Isaiah. And one of the things that second Isaiah does is to give the people in exile. So he's almost certainly preaching to people who are in exile in Babylon, who are feeling a great dejection and no longer understanding the Yahweh that they had relied on when they were in Jerusalem. And so Second Isaiah, among other things, gives them a new collection of ways of talking about God that will help them to have a fuller experience of God while they are in exile. One way of talking about that is that these multiple metaphors, referring to metaphors that, that are talking about God, are expressions of Israel's experience of exile. This is how they are experiencing God while they are in exile. New metaphors have the power to create a new reality. Think about that. If we find new ways of speaking about old things, it can help people to open their eyes, their ears, and their hearts in a new way. And that's in fact what Second Isaiah or Isaiah of Babylon is doing, opening them to new ways of not just understanding but experiencing God. So he asks the question, you know, when you're thinking about God, how are we going to talk about him? To whom will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? Do you know, even before he answers that or gives different images, isn't even asking the question itself, moving people to start reflecting on their own images of God. One of the things that the prophets do is use every form of speech, whether it's a question, a statement, an exclamation, a command, using all of those to draw people um, into the experience. So, the, the new metaphors. So Deutero Isaiah, Isaiah of Babylon, innovative use of metaphors functions to create a reality of hope and exile. The people are more despondent. Who is this God that we once knew? How can we understand? To whom will you compare me that I shall be like him, says the Holy One. So uses terms that are familiar, Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, I am, which goes back to God's first uh, giving a sense of identity to Moses. Who shall I tell Pharaoh that you are? And God says, Echye Esher Echye. I am whoever I am, whoever I will be, whatever, even whatever I cause to be. So the God of Moses is still the God of Isaiah. And then he has this rich collection of metaphors in order to help the people think about all of the ways that God is present to them. Redeemer, warrior, creator, savior, mother, father, shepherd, king, artisan. I think that the way that Isaiah uses such a rich collection of metaphor 
um, is an invitation, a challenge for us in our day to think about ways of talking about God that will be a challenge, a catalyst, an inspiration for people to understand God, uh, perhaps in a new way. Uh, one scholar talks about this imagery of Isaiah, saying that he gathered together the whole Israelite knowledge of God into a rich feast that we can do no more than taste of it. You get a taste of it. But it is a feast that in some ways continues to whet our appetite as we go through and we think about each of the meanings. You know, what does that word redeemer mean? What did it mean to the people in the ancient world? A redeemer, a goel, was the closest relative the one who had the responsibility as their nearest uh, kinsman to rescue them from slavery, from imprisonment, from poverty. So what Isaiah is saying, God is your closest relative, even here as you are in exile. And if you understand him as your closest relative, you can count on him to be the one who will bring you out of, of exile. Let's just go to the last one, to an artisan. The first time that God is pictured as an artisan is in Genesis chapter two, when God forms Adam out of the, the Adma, out of the, the stuff of the earth. God is the original artisan of creation. And he continues to act as an artisan, creating something new for the people in exile. So we might think of the imagery, the poetic imagery that Isaiah of Babylon used, and then how might we develop some of our own, as well as explaining the imagery that he uses. One other passage that... Uh, we won't look extensively, but it's on your handout, and I use it as sort of a, of a model of a way to think about um, developing um, our own poetic imagery. So this is for, from Third Isaiah, but still the, the poetry of the whole book kind of goes together. So when we look at this particular passage, you see that it occurs on the first Sunday of Advent, year B. So I chose another reading that will be coming up very soon in the liturgical year. We're in year A now, so we'll be starting year B. So we can take this passage and simply read it all by itself as a beautiful, powerful, poetic proclamation. And we can see the imagery, Yahweh, you're our father. And we see that this passage ends again with bringing that, that same imagery. You are our father. And that, ah, the image of the potter, the artisan. So we can just read it, do no study, no background, and we will understand a lot and perhaps experience it. If we want to have a richer experience of the poetry, I suggest three things that might help us. So before doing that, let me just uh, go back to my friend here, um, Marilyn McIntyre. When she presents these different poets and sees them as, as people who are praying, the first thing that she invites us to do and that I did was simply read the poem and experience it. So we can do that too with this, this uh, prophecy from Isaiah. Simply read it in total isolation. And what do you experience? Probably a lot. You know, you will see, you will feel those different images, father, redeemer, potter, etc. You see the different verb uh, sentence forms, etc. So we can get a lot. What McIntyre did then, after she invites us to simply read the poem, is read her commentary. And what she often did 
was give a historical context to the poem. So, for example, she would say, this poem was written during World War I. Then when I read it, I heard something different. I could get the context of how the original audience might have heard it and somehow join into that experience because I knew the historical context. So here, when we hear this um, passage from Isaiah 63, what's the historical context? It was probably right after the, the return of the exile in Babylon. So remember, second Isaiah, they're in Babylon. Here now they've returned. And, and during the exile, they're given all of this hope. The, the message of, of second Isaiah is giving them a lot of hope. But when they returned from exile, they expected to experience again the glory of the idyllic land promised to their ancestors. And in fact, the, the kind of imagery that second Isaiah promoted. When the reality turned out to be starkly different with the temple and cities in ruins, the economy and legal systems fractured, the justice unheeded, Isaiah cried out in lamentation to God. So if we know that historical context and then we read this, we get something more. This is him speaking to a people who have a new reason for some of the despondence that even the exiles felt. So how are they hearing it now when their hopes have not been fulfilled? The literary context, which is closely related to the historical context, is that this poem that begins on in verse 16 and notice 16b and it doesn't it leaves out some things in between actually is part of a longer poem that began earlier and that longer poem is a lament it's a lament much like many of the psalms in which the 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 psalmist or the whole community are crying out to god how long will this endure so when we then read this and experience the poem, both in the historical and literary context, it can open up new ways for us to hear and experience it. Then the third context is the liturgical one. We're hearing it on the first Sunday of Advent. And I love the, the, the poems of Advent, the Isaiah passages that are so filled with hope. This is not the same tenor. Why do we have this on the first Sunday of Advent? How can we help congregations to experience this as our own crying out, how long, our Lord? We're waiting. We're waiting for you to come and for us to experience you anew. So I've given you three contexts, but we realize that there's at least one more and probably further but there's also the personal context. It can be the personal context of a parish. Um, sometimes there are parishes that have just gone through um, a turmoil, maybe the loss or the death of someone important in that parish, maybe a fire. Um, maybe it is the political context, maybe it's the pandemic so that we look at that context as well in order to hear and experience that poetic poetry. Um, I get no um, commission at all, but if you want to have some help maybe in uh, new ways of listening to poetry and getting a sense of, of opening up the richness um, I think that this book, When Poets Pray, um, might be a helpful entryway into that. I'm just going to, before we take our time for conversation, going to read the opening and closing of this and just experience those verses. Don't worry about thinking too much. Experience them and experience the white fire around them. You, Yahweh, are our Father, our Redeemer. You are named forever. You, Yahweh, 
you are our father. We are the clay and you the potter. We are all the work of your hands. Amen. So we have about 15 minutes if we would like to have some conversation. Um, and it can be a follow-up from this morning. Uh, questions, insights, uh, experience, objections, anything that um, you would like to participate in our conversation. While you're thinking, may I say one more thing? Um, among other things that I, I taught at the seminary was the class on the Psalms. And typically, maybe it was even one of you of my former students said, well, what's the best commentary on the Psalms? And the answer, the best commentary is the rest of the Bible. And what's the best commentary on the prophets? The rest of the Bible. Both the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, the Torah, and the, the writings, as well as the, the New Testament. To understand the prophets, both their perennial message and their poetry, the, the other passages in the, uh, the biblical tradition, both the Old and the New Testament, can help us. So sometimes if we think, I really don't understand this, see if there isn't another place in scripture that might give some insight or way of uh, delving into it, understanding it more fully. Yes, uh, Father Monsignor Robert. Well, yes. just a, a thought about context. And um, <clears throat> I preached on Isaiah 55 a few Sundays ago. Um, and I was tempted after reading that line, let the scoundrel forsake his way to talk about all the people that don't like to wear face masks at church or refuse. But what I did was, since it was the end of uh, second Isaiah, I took folks back first to the beginning of chapter 55, which talks about eating without price. And from there, I took them back to the first verses of second Isaiah, comfort, give comfort to my people, prepare the way of the Lord. And talked about, you know, the end of the Babylonian exile and the end, hopefully, of this pandemic. And how do we prepare for that? And which includes forsaking our wickedness and our, our lack of faith. It, kind of like the, the um, folks in Isaiah's time thought that they were being punished for their uh, sinfulness or failure to follow the covenant. Uh, we might look at this pandemic as some kind of punishment, but we can always also see God bringing uh, good out of evil. So, mm. but, yeah. And I think, yeah, yeah thank you. So that, that's a good combination of you're drawing on the richness of the tradition. You are impelling, inspiring people without hitting them over the head, um, maybe giving them some insight of, of a way to respond to this present uh, situation. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bishop Tyson, did I, or did I see your hand up or you're just, okay. Uh, yes, Monsignor, when I see a hand, I'm not sure if, if you're just waving at me or if you have a question. Father Tom, you're muted. Uh, I'm unmuted now. Okay. <clears throat> this is just sort of a, a query. If, if you look at uh, two uh, parts of the New Testament, the prodigal son and actually the, the father of the sons, and then the sower of the seed who casts an awful lot of his seed in the places that uh, doesn't produce fruit. We, we look at these prophets and the beautiful things they wrote and the message they had, and uh, we have so much of them in the Bible. Um, God seems kind of prodigal, like we don't seem to respond to this very well. Mm. Uh, at, at times when we, uh, when we look at it carefully like we are today and you see all these riches, um, you have this sense that uh, we could do better, but it, it's curious that God doesn't seem to care uh, 
that everybody uh, runs to the stage and uh, applauds what he's doing. It's a, it's just a, a an observation about uh, us and God and and why don't we listen to him more carefully? Mm. That's a, that's a good point. And I like your image. It, it's the prodigal father, the prodigal God, the one who's extravagant. And and as we saw earlier, that God doesn't wait for people to repent before promising something new, you know, a new covenant. That That, that is the, the promise and the hope, but invites and challenge, challenges, urges us to respond uh, to that invitation. You know, one of the other questions that maybe is a little bit related to this that I was going to ask you this morning, this might be a, a, a challenge. Um, in Jeremiah's day, you remember his temple sermon when the people are saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Uh, that's what was almost like a mantra. You know, as long as we rely on the temple of the Lord, we don't have to worry about anything else. Are there mantras today that people might be saying that this is where they put their reliance and that the prophetic word today might need to be like Jeremiah's to say, you know, that's a thick hair. That's a, that's a word of deception. The one that came to mind, but you might think of others was the stock market, the stock market, the stock market. You know, that's, that's our sense of security or our salvation. So a prophetic word might be to say that that's really a word of deception, that there is something else that God is um, offering to you, calling you to do and to be. Brother Tom? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Parks, I was just really tickled with what you were talking about regarding poetry in general. Uh, and because years ago, uh, back in the 70s, when I was studying psychotherapy, um, one of the things they were suggesting to us that we do for recreation was read poetry, as well as read plays, in order to learn how to listen uh, to people when, when speaking, who were, you know, bearing their souls, or at least talking to us. So that we would always hear the metaphor and in the words that people would use, uh, keep listening very carefully because the, the theory was that we all speak in metaphors even when we're not aware of it. Yeah, good. Yeah, we're telling people about ourselves and what we're thinking um, and the use of metaphor. And so, and it, it works in, in other ways when we, if we read the scripture, read the the gospel for Sunday, for example, what is it we hear? And we need to read it often and hear it in, a lot and then convey it. And one of the ways that uh, some use to convey the metaphor of, scri of scripture is to use the, the metaphors that Jesus used all the time as parables um, uh, so that people would, uh, well, hear the message, but uh, hear it more deeply than just reading the words. Uh, at any rate, I just, I was, the, the whole idea of reading poetry and then listen, learning how to listen to the words is, is, is good for all of us as we listen to scripture as well. So, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do you know, um, as you were speaking, I, I thought of one very short little poem by Mary Oliver. Uh, a favorite contemporary poet, and she calls it Instructions for Living a Life. But I thought it could also be entitled Instructions for Being a Prophet. Very short. It goes like this. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. Three little things. That's what she says is how we should live a life, and it's a pretty good description of what prophets should do. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. Any other comments or perhaps from, from this morning? And, and do you have any other mantras that people might be saying instead of the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, or the stock market, the stock market? Trump, Trump, Trump. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be careful and not go there. <laughs> I had... Uh... I, uh, most of us have uh, learned 
I think, over the course of the last six months or so of the, uh, the challenge of celebrating Mass outdoors. And, uh, and this is just speak from my own experience, uh, that people, um, the people yearn for the comfort of, of their particular pew and their particular space in the pew inside. And it was really summed up, uh, the other side of the coin was summed up for me by a woman who's, by one of my parishioners who was really always there, if you will, at the outdoor mass uh, for the parishes, for mine, for my two parishes. She said, Father, the fact that we still have mass, we can attend mass, whether it's indoor or outdoor, you know, is, is, is not relevant. We can, we, can, we can go to mass and that's what's most important. But I found that there were no few number of people who, you know, constantly were asking you, Father, when are we going back indoors? As in, struck me as in their comfort zone, as in, and I get that, but it just was something, you know, that resonates with me and that I, that I take away from that. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Father, Monsignor. Well, and speaking of mantras, and one that I've been using a lot more this past several months um, as people respond to their stress and their anger in a multitude of unhealthy ways, and including myself at times, the father blaze of happy memory, God bless the human condition. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So I'll give you one other little thing you might want to try um, in order to um, unleash your own uh, poetic prophecy. Um, during these days of pandemics, I, I think I told some of you this this summer, um, some of my family and friends, we, we had what we called a six word challenge. And to say, take one main idea. Uh, maybe the idea is conversion or prophecy or whatever word you want to take and write about it in six words. And the six words could be a sentence, or it could be just individual um, words. It can be borrowed from, stolen from someone else. So, for example, I stole one when, when our topic that we were sharing was pandemic. My six words was absence makes the heart grow fonder. Six words that for me was summing up my experience of being in in isolation. So sometimes if you want to really zero in on one aspect of the prophetic word, take one word and then talk about it in six. For the, the last passage that we looked at, the word father, can you have six words to describe that? Or the word redeemer, something like that, or clay. We are the clay. Um, and doing that can help us to expand our experience of the image and perhaps find it another way of uh, speaking about it to, uh, to those to whom we are ministering, as well as to ourselves. So my friends, it looks like this time is about over. And if we, um, Monsignor, uh, Robert Seiler. We'll stop now and come back in 15 minutes. <laughs>